together of uh, retail real estate specialists around the country. I've got everybody from Pleasanton to New York to Florida, pretty much everywhere in some of the hottest markets around the country. So guys, thank you for tuning in or coming in today. Um, I think what we can do is we can jump right in and tell us what's going on in each one of your marketplaces. Uh, I guess who wants to get Michael, you want to go first? Uh, Give us a little bit of your background, you know, who you are, what market you're serving, and then the data on your marketplace. All right. So my name is Michael Betancourt. I'm a retail uh, broker here in South Florida, specializing mainly in Miami. Mm -hmm. um, I work with Cats and Associates. We represent uh, over 100 tenants in South Florida. I'm handling all of our Miami stuff, working with some new cool tenants, um, most of it is is uh, high street and urban stuff. Uh, it's basically who I am. I've been in real estate for about 10 years now. All in Miami. Okay. Uh, tell us a little bit about your market. What's going on there? Can you tell us about, you know, last year and then where we're at right now and what you see coming in down the road? So, I mean, last year with the pandemic, uh, a lot of things changed. A lot of things slowed down. For the first few months, we had a very short window of lockdown. Um, and then, you know, they, they started loosening it up, uh, especially to restaurants to be able to do outdoor dining, uh, which helped a bunch. Um, and then, you know, as the months went on and, you know, more and more places were being locked down, more and more eyeballs were being focused on Miami and South Florida. So we've been able to get a lot of uh, action um, from the Northeast, from the Midwest, from the West Coast, all coming here and trying to, to open up uh, locations, which has been crazy because, you know, most of our restaurant spaces aren't lasting on the market if they get to the market at all. Um, you know, that, that, that's kind of, uh, and, and in the dry retail space, we've actually seen, you know, the five belows and the altars of the world continue to roll out across the entire state um, without stopping and, and, and they're doing very well. And moving forward, we can only see it, you know, getting better. There's going to be some turnover uh, of, of some of the stuff, but, you know, restaurant spaces, again, you know, it's, it's the hot commodity down here now. You know, if you have it, you, you don't even have to put it on market. And, you know, we do, you know, us at our firm represent a lot of these uh, larger dry retail users. And, you know, they're all coming back to us and, and wanting space. So there's, we see, you know, 2021, 2022 actually being very good years for us. Okay. How small business operators, are they coming back in full force too? They are. It's, it's crazy because I've talked to some and I was actually having a discussion with some brokers today earlier. And the biggest hurdle they're actually seeing is getting people to actually want to work because they have, right. you know, the, the business is there. You know, they have the funds now to expand and do more locations, but some people just rather stay home and, and collect, you know, the benefits than, than actually work. So finding employees is actually the challenge today in, in Miami, in South Florida. Okay. Yeah, you're seeing that. In the, it, I know we're seeing it in California a little bit too, especially in the restaurant industry, but I'll let George touch on that. Um, concessions. What kind of concessions are you guys getting? Are you seeing uh, it, it varies, you know, dry retailers, it's still the standard, you know, what, you know, if it's a national tenant, you know, they have their work letters and they're able to get most of it uh, from landlords today on the restaurant side, because of the, the, you know, the, how hot it is and how, how much, you know, people want it, you know, you, you're, it's, it's tough to get some of these concessions because you're getting outbid by some people. Um, you know, we recently picked up uh, uh, National Dispensary Crew Relief, and we're doing their work for the entire state. And we were even on that end, we were getting outbid because, you know, just, you know, a former bank branch or something like that. And the competitor goes in there and just goes over asking. Not a lot of contingency, not a lot of contingencies, not a lot of uh, concessions. They just need space. Wow. So it's very tight. 
Are you seeing a lot of people? Where are most of the people coming from? Well, if you read the headlines, they all come from New York. New York is probably empty right now. If we read the headlines, they're all in Miami. <laughs> I I think it's 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 been it, it hasn't really changed. We're getting some people from New York, some people from Latin America, some people from the Midwest, people from from uh, the West Coast. But you know, it's not like all these people are leaving. You know, all these other states, and they're all here. I mean, it's it's what we've seen year over year. You know, people retire and move to Florida. You know, some people from Latin America and South America move to Florida and open up, you know, uh, their businesses. But, you know, it's not like, you know, the headlines say it is. Okay. What do you see happening over the next 18 to 24 months? Over the 18, next 18 to 24 months in retail, I see, at least in Miami, I see we're going to get some, you know, rent corrections uh, because there's some locations that just the rents are astronomical and and hard to even explain and fathom but i still see there being you know a lot of interest in the market i see a lot of deals getting done i see you know even investment opportunities are going to be tight um and you know i I just see the market you know growing still okay all right all right michael thank you very much uh jessica you want to tell us about pleasanton or the East Bay, I should say. We'll kind of we'll kind of go into the I guess the whole East Bay. I'll start about a little bit about myself. I'm Jessica Mauser. I am the CEO and president of Lean Associates East Bay Inc., uh, which we handle Oakland and Pleasanton. We have a Walnut Creek office as well. So we have we cover most of the suburban communities that lie just outside of San Francisco to the direct east. Um, I've been in commercial real estate since 2005. I made my way into retail in 2009. So I've been uh, at the retail game for a while now and can say that I lived through the last recession. And so it's interesting to compare and contrast what's happening in vacancy now, um, as opposed to where we were 2009. Um, So most of my business is in the bedroom communities of the East Bay. That's, you know, 30 miles outside of San Francisco. We've seen our vacancy fairly flat at this point in time, but that's due to the fact that we have a lot of regulation in place, including eviction moratoriums um, that have all been extended actually through July in our municipalities. The other thing that we have working against us at this juncture is that we still don't have inside dining. I was out last night and our restaurant still can't seat people inside. So we are still in a place of outside dining only. And a lot of our businesses can't even open to 25%, let alone any percent inside. So what that's done is it's put a freeze hold on the entire Bay Area. There's very few businesses leaving, but there's also very few absorbing um, what we had from leftover from 2019. So our numbers have remained relatively flat. When you look at our sales across the retail uh, world, we've actually saw an uptick in 2020. And I think that's only because sellers who knew that they had a short game to sell needed to get out while they could. And so we saw our volume of retail sales actually jump significantly um, through 2020. And so we are continuing to see that type of uh, activity going on. And that's actually across all platforms. If you look at what our industrial sales are doing, office, and retail, those sellers who knew that they were gonna get out in the next couple of years are trying to strike before prices go down. So we've only seen about a one to 2% decrease in pricing and that's both on the sales side and the leasing side. But where we are seeing is concessions in terms of our lease rates. Um, Oakland suffered tremendously because they actually had a lot of new construction come to market in 2019, which was not able to be absorbed when we walked into 2020. So what's happening now is we're seeing tenant improvements on new construction, mixed use projects in excess of 100 to $120 a square foot to get tenants into these new construction projects. Um, So that's staying within the Berkeley, Oakland market, new construction, but we're seeing that ripple effect come out to the bedroom communities as well. Even though the bedroom communities have fared a lot better than when you look at an Oakland, a San Francisco or Berkeley, through the whole COVID effect. Um, Our bedroom communities are sitting about 12% in vacancy, which is a little bit higher than normal. We normally run 11%, maybe 10% vacancy in these communities, Uh, but we haven't seen prices change. Again, where we're seeing the concessions 
is a little more free rent. And then if it's new construction, the landlords are actually delivering the spaces to a more finished shelf than say a vanilla or even a cold shell that they would have received in 1819, kind of at the peak of our leasing. Can you speak to what's going on in San Francisco? Do you know enough about that market? I don't know tarot, a, a whole lot about it, but I obviously have some friends who work that market. We actually had a conversation just recently about this this Friday night. Um, San Francisco is a bit of a, a mixed bag right now. The financial district, because there are no employees, Uber's not there, Facebook isn't there, and the financial district also is very limited in terms of employees coming in and out. Um, those areas are really hard hit. Market Street, financial district, even down along uh, the ferry building and, and such. So those main areas that are very touristy and traditionally have had a lot of foot traffic from big business is very quiet and you have a situation where the homeless population has actually moved into those areas. Um, the smaller communities that are outside of the financial district, um, and that would be Noe Valley, you can go up to um, the Presidio and other places such as that. Um, they're doing okay because those are more neighborhood communities. It's really the downtown of San Francisco that's gotten hit the worst out of all of this. So, um, and that's that's something that it'll be a while until we see businesses. Although um, their Uber did announce and Facebook did announce that they're going to bring back 10% of their workforce to San Francisco, which should be interesting. But up until this point, it's actually been illegal for these um, businesses to send people back to work. Uh, they haven't been able to because you can't get the occupancy. They're not rated to have occupancy in the elevators and other places. So uh, the Facebooks and the Ubers and um, the big businesses of the world that do live in San downtown San Francisco weren't able to send their employees back even if they wanted to. When do you think that you were going to start seeing a turn there? Anytime? You know, it'll be interesting to see. You got 10% of the workforce potentially coming back as of June. And then from there, you're going to have uh, potentially more in the spring, or excuse me, the fall. But I don't know that we will really see people come back to work in the way that we once did. If you look at BART, for example, nobody wants to send their employees on public transit right now. BART ridership is at 6%, 6 to 8% of their normal ridership. Um, and one of the things that Facebook announced when they said, hey, 10% are coming back is there's no more shuttles which has been their main route of getting employees to work because people live so far from downtown San Francisco, unless you're young and you're in the midst of everything. But when rent prices were $5,000 for a one bedroom apartment, you didn't have a whole lot of young folks wanting to scoop up that, that apartment. So um, the, the lack of transit, the lack of the buses getting to those, I don't see a whole lot of people jumping on quickly to go back to work in a corporate environment where they no longer get their free lunches and their massages and their workouts and all the other perks that go with working at a tech company. So um, it'll be interesting. I think that it's going to be a bit of a long game for San Francisco proper. I, I think that it's going to be two to three years until we see those change. I think our suburbs are, are actually going to do okay. And I, I suspect we'll kind of right the boat in the next 12 to 18 months. Um, maybe sooner if some of these bigger companies do start to open those 10 kind of 20,000 square foot offices in the suburbs um, to get people back into the office a little more regularly. Okay. All right, Jessica, thank you very much. Eddie, Absolutely. tell us about uh, Phoenix. What's going on down there? It's a hot market and it's getting hotter. <laughs> no pun intended. Good morning, everybody. Really, none? Hey, with summer coming, it's going to be hot. <laughs> Yeah. 90 this week. I love it. <laughs> Arizona boy, 100 degrees is the perfect temperature for me. Yeah, no thanks. Crazy, Eddie. Crazy. My name's Eddie Gonzalez. I'm a commercial real estate advisor here in the Phoenix, Arizona market. I focus mainly on central Phoenix, although the data that I pulled for you is going to be all of the Phoenix metro area. So I'm just gonna dive into these numbers real quick and then we can open it up to questions. Uh, 234 million square feet of retail space currently in the Phoenix Metro. That is actually on its way down a little bit because of construction. Uh, it's actually down 53% over last year. So I found that to be really interesting. What we are seeing an absolute ton of is mixed use of that mixed use, a very small portion of that is becoming retail. 
There's some huge projects right now that are happening. There's um, multiple malls that are going to be redeveloped into mixed use programs. So I'm kind of excited to see how those turn out and what the retail portion of it truly does. In the past with those mixed use spaces, you don't see a ton of leasing on the retail portion of it. When I was speaking with a developer, and this is pre-COVID, they were really talking about how that is almost extra space is what they were calling it at that time. So I'm interested to see how some of these bigger projects actually end up doing. So absorption uh, last year, one year ago, it was 1,820,000 square feet. Right now we're at 702,000 square feet. Vacancy rates, just a little bit off, 0.14. So currently 7.2% last year, it was 7.13. Uh, price per square foot rent wise, we are actually trending up at $19.46. Market for sale, also just barely up. Last year it was 192 per square foot, right now 194 per square foot. And then as far as cap rates go, and this is interesting, I generally don't spend a ton of time on these numbers. What I'm seeing and what I'm feeling versus what I'm reading on this data, it's saying that cap rates are hovering around 7.1. I'm seeing some banana numbers as far as cap rates right now. I recently brought a developer a deal. He was redeveloping it, retenanting it, brand new building, long-term lease. He said, I need a four cap on this thing, which for Arizona, like, all right, we're pushing the limits, four cap. I went and got it for him. And he responds back to me, you know, Based on the activity, I think we're looking three, maybe three and a half cap. So what's happening with the numbers say and what is actually happening in my backyard are different. I don't know if anyone else is seeing that, but it's different. Where are all these buyers coming from, Eddie? Your local state. Oh, great, okay. <laughs> Your money's yeah, coming a, my way. It's unfortunate. <laughs> they keep coming over to all of these other states and they're racking up prices. It's been tough. Yeah, there are a lot of California buyers coming this way. There's a lot of te California t tenants coming this way. Is there? We, it's tough finding space right now. I should rephrase that. It is tough finding good space right now. I've got four restaurant tenants that are looking for, and they originally wanted second gen. I don't think we're going to find them second gen. So they're going to end up going into a box of some sort and we're going to have to build it out. But great real estate is not hitting it. I'm doing something unconventional today. I've got a restaurant that I have the listing for. I'm going to actually take it out to market. I want to see what happens if this thing hits the street and see how much activity I'm actually going to get. Teeny tiny restaurant, completely built out, awesome space. The current tenant outgrew it pretty quickly and they're moving down the street. So I'll let you know. I'll let you know right. what happens tomorrow. So it sounds like things are still gonna keep getting better and better in Arizona, huh? I really think so. I mean, we're open 100% right now. All right. All right, well, George, on that note, let's hear a little bit about California. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're gonna take it back to where Jessica started. <laughs> so. <laughs> Now, um, the Los Angeles market, surprisingly, is not much different than uh, the Northern California market from what we're seeing, although we have seen a lot of interest in as far as the retail goes. Myself, George Pino, Commercial Brokers International, and CEO of Commercial Brokers International, started the company 16 years ago. We have uh, about 12 agents right now specializing in different aspects of commercial real estate. Uh, primarily service the Southern California marketplace. I have a subspecialty doing a lot of single tenant net lease throughout the country. Um, and uh, that's kind of it for myself. Now, as far as the retail markets go, what's interesting, and there's a couple things, and Michael, I'm gonna pick your brain a little bit about Carolief in a little bit too, but, um, but uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's an interesting marketplace. I mean, there's a couple things that Eddie had said as well as uh, Jessica had said, you know, in that, uh, you know, we, we have a pretty large retail data marketplace in Los Angeles, almost 447 million square feet. 
Um, the vacancies, though, and the occupancies completely thrown off the numbers wise from what the reports are. And a lot of that is because of what's going on, as Jessica mentioned, with moratoriums for evictions and opening up. Um, where we have seen a lot of activity when it comes to the leasing side um, and, and investment side is really a lot of times on the restaurant um, as well as service industries. We're starting to see a little bit more of, uh, of course, everyone's been talking about experiential retail for ages, but we're starting to see actually um, some of the big box uh, being converted to last mile distribution. You know, um, recently Amazon just bought a Costco for $80 million. Um, and uh, it's a vacant Costco that they're going to be converting out to. They're spending about another $20 million on the rehab, and this is down in the South Bay um, in a very difficult area for last mile distribution, but it's also close to the uh, uh, the Torrance Airport, which will allow for uh, drone de drone deliveries and distribution as well. Um, but so we're starting to see a little bit of that, but we're also seeing, you know, what people have talked about a little bit on the conversion side of things. You know, we have um, this, I don't want to say started because we've been seeing it a little bit before, but the biggest one, obviously, that people have talked about was uh, Google taking over the Westside Pavilion Mall. So essentially, they took the entire mall. Um, there's going to be some retail down below, and there's also some other retail just onto the side of it as well. But for the most part, they've taken all, the entire mall, and they're in the middle of converting it. They've been de developing it for the last uh, year and a little bit over a year now to create creative office for a new campus for Google. Um, we're also seeing, you know, they just announced up in uh, Santa Barbara, which although not quite the LA market, it's, you know, close enough to the Ventura County to, that we follow and track things. But, uh, you know, there's a vacant Macy's up in Santa Barbara that they're actually converting to, again, creative office space. Um, so we're starting to see a lot of that happen where we're, we're looking at some of the bigger boxes where people are closing their footprints down, looking for smaller footprints and where developers are starting to get a little creative on what they can do, um, whether you know it, it's converting to the office space or mixed use or breaking up the spaces themselves. Um, one thing I did notice, though, a lot of times is our uh, lease negotiations, which were last year dead in the beginning part of it, <laughs> um, once COVID hit, because no one knew what was going on and what was happening, but it really started picking up with uh, restaurants and drive through restaurants especially. Um, but what I've really noticed is that we're looking at uh, longer time frames to negotiate out the lease, specifically on sticking points with, uh, you know, when it comes to the uh, act of God uh, clauses, um, you know, where we're coming in and refining that language as much as possible. Um, you know, I just repositioned a fast food drive through in uh, Santa Monica, and literally it was three and a half, four weeks of negotiating just that one clause um, and trying to figure that out. So, you know, we we came to an understanding and I think that the landlord's happy um, with it as well, but it was a lot easier because it was actually an owner user landlord that was getting out of the business and leasing it back. So they understood what was going on a little bit more so than most other developers or, or uh, well, the developers understand it, they just don't want to give it. <laughs> So the, give the concessions away. Um, as far as concessions go, we are seeing big concessions as well for new developments. Um, you know, the, the one thing I noticed uh, a little bit uh, is build outs, um, high demand locations are, are there. When we saw near the end of the year last year, when we saw a lot of restaurant closures, we actually started seeing a lot of uh, restaurants with, uh, you know, being offered up for without key money. And a lot of other, um, you know, from New York to um, especially New York, uh, restaurateurs looking to expand out in this marketplace, starting to look at different areas, but also understanding I don't want to put any key money into it now because they, you know, the feeling was that they're getting quite a bit. We actually even had a uh, a restaurant that came available almost turnkey. Uh, higher end restaurant, and the landlord was still offering close to about fifty, sixty dollars a foot in TI. Um, we're also talking much higher rental rates, uh, generally speaking. You know, the the uh, I think the average with LA County is around two dollars, but generally speaking, for most of the higher end, in demand areas, 
you're looking at uh, five to six on a monthly basis, so 50 to $72 a month still, plus triple nets. Um, and then in some areas going up to 12, $15 a square foot, uh, so 150 to 180 uh, a year in, in, uh, in rents plus your triple nets. Average triple nets are probably about a uh, dollar and a quarter right now per square foot per month. Um, some of the newer buildings a little bit higher, but yeah. So that's kind of what we're seeing in the marketplace. It's pretty good activity now, though. You've seen it pick up the last few weeks? Absolutely. A lot more interest. Um, you know, when we started announcing, uh, LA started announcing the openings, uh, we saw a real big pickup with a lot of inquiries. And now we're starting to see a little bit of a holdback because they're trying to figure out exactly timing wise um, and build out to see, you know, they're, they're trying to, to time the opening openings. You know, right now we're, we're supposedly 25% open for indoor dining, but a lot of restaurants have not even opened that up yet. Um, they're still keeping it just takeout only, mainly because of the workforce, as well as the feeling for a lot of, you know, depending on the type of restaurant, a lot of the uh, uh, clients don't necessarily want to sit and eat, um, especially for the QSRs or FSR type restaurants where it's more take takeaway. Um, and and I'm lumping in um, not just the national brands when it comes to the QSRs or FSRs, but we have quite a bit of um, smaller mom and pop that are growing brands um, within the LA marketplace that even them, you know, what, whether it's like a Dave's Hot Chicken, um, they went completely takeout 100% delivery only. Um, they won't even allow walk up windows. Um, so, you know, there, there's different, different, different aspects, different things that we're still seeing. Um, we're seeing a big rush in ghost kitchens as well, of course, um, which I think a lot of people have as well, and there's been, because of that, that's affecting a little bit more of the industrial market um, side of life um, as well. So almost all the essential retailers have really expressed a lot of interest. We're actually starting to see a big push toward a lot of the cannabis users. We don't do a whole lot of cannabis, um, and uh, but, you know, we're starting to see that because it's the timing is starting to come up to tie up the properties and move forward on it um, for California. Uh, we are also seeing in the secondary marketplace a little bit more interest in the cannabis field coming in um, where you have a lot of REITs that are coming in with cash capital coming in and, and taking off. And the main reason is because you're looking at, uh, you know, right now probably I'd say about a 3x of uh, multiple for um, your cannabis use. A couple years ago was probably about a 5x multiple. So you have REITs coming in that are coming in and looking at uh, acquiring a property that is still, you know, at a 10 plus cap rate, and it still makes sense for the landlord because they're still selling it at one and a half times what they would have paid <clears throat> because of the higher rental rates or what they would have gotten. So we're seeing that kind of activity as well. So what I'm hearing you say is not everybody's left California yet. No, and, and you know, I, I, I uh, as much as I uh, like Phoenix, Miami, New York, and all that, um, it, not everyone's left California, and more people are moving to California. So we're still having a net positive uh, growth rate. Um, it's just uh, I think some of the income levels may get affected a little bit, and we're going to see some adjustments there and, and, and whatnot. 18 to 24 months out looking pretty solid, especially as we open up. I'd say 18 months, uh, maybe 24 for some of those uh, uh, softer markets and other areas that are a little bit more, um, I don't want to say tertiary when it comes to Los Angeles, uh, cause, but there are some uh, outer markets. Um, and then, But at the same time, we're also seeing a pretty good uh, of, uh, movement from within as far as repositioning of people living going out to the Inland Empire, much like how a lot of the East Bay has seen a lot going out to Lathrop. Uh, Modesto uh, and, and you know kind of that Central Valley so we're seeing a lot of imp, uh, push toward going uh, a little bit further east a little bit less coastal um, rental rates are much cheaper there but we're also seeing a lot more interest in developers out that way as well okay All right, thank you George uh, Carol why don't you tell us a little bit about what's going on in Texas Hi everyone, a, a quick introduction of myself. My name is Carol Snyder. I'm a tenant rep based out of uh, Houston. Uh, so I work the Houston MSA and South Texas markets, including San Antonio, 
McAllen Mission, Texas, um, and up up toward well down towards the border. Um, primarily, what I'm seeing is a lot of activity on drive-throughs. Um, I would say there's a lot of competition for restaurant space in general. Uh, but we entered COVID with really strong numbers in our uh, occupancy rate. We were about 94% occupied. Um, and that has slightly decreased until like 93.4%. Uh, so, but we're still seeing a lot of activity. A lot of people are seeing leasing pick up in the last few weeks, and actually since it's the year started. Um, as far as concessions go in the market, we are seeing somewhere between six to 12 months of free rent uh, given to even restaurant and uh, retailers, uh, but uh, that, that, which is pretty, pretty good, pretty solid <laughs> given the competition. Um, but some of these restaurants that we're uh, in after, you're seeing more than two, three offers on the table and one where there's more than 10 offers on one restaurant space. And uh, it doesn't matter the footprint. <laughs> Is it, are you getting more institute or large restaurants or are you seeing more local restaurants that are coming in and open, taking the opportunity to open up? So primarily I would say um, uh, fast casual franchises uh, that are, okay. I see coming in from California as well as Florida. Okay. Yeah. All and right. so, yeah, mainly that's, that's who I'm dealing with. Um, I right now just upwards of um, 30 something deals in my pipeline about 20 something of those are just restaurants. Okay. How's right. Are you seeing in, on the retail side, like the big uh, national brands coming in as well? Uh, so I, I'm not sure about the retail. I mean, what I hear about with, with my colleagues is activity is picking up. Uh, but primarily, I deal with restaurants and drive throughs um, They're definitely seeing a lot of that. And you're you're one hundred percent open in Texas now, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, for about two two and a half weeks now. Okay. And, and even yeah, even through COVID, um, yeah, visits to the restaurants may have decreased, but we've seen. Uh, an increase in uh, the restaurant's uh, sales because they're capitalizing, well, the national chains are. The national chains are with the drive-throughs and people that are positioned to have window delivery takeout. Um, I would say mainly fine dining is probably who's, who's hurting the most. Okay. Uh, what do you see coming out the next 18, 24 months? Still just strong growth? Uh, I believe we're positioned, like Houston's positioned to have strong growth. I think we're attracting um, a lot of uh, people coming in. I think with everyone's sentiment that's outside of California, we're seeing a lot of that come in. Uh, given that we are strong in aerospace, uh, medical, oil and gas, and tech, we're going to continue to see a, a strong path to recovery. Um, and I, I see a lot of continued competition for these drive throughs Yeah. Yeah, we did a residential real estate jam session a couple of weeks ago and the residential market there is on fire. It just seems like more people are moving into Texas. And so I think your growth is going to stay really strong. So yeah, we, um, we're seeing a lot of those people like move into the suburbs. So like even the suburbs are performing very well out here. Um, and so I, I think we're positioned to recover pretty strongly. Okay. Yeah, I think so too. Um, thank you, Carol. Any questions for Carol? All right, Kyle, you guys were hit the hardest up there. Yeah. Let's hear what you got. Man, how much time do we have here? Yeah, uh, my name is uh, Kyle and Sarah. I'm a commercial real estate advisor, uh, tenant rep broker here in New York with Sabre. Uh, I do focus primarily on food use and restaurant concepts. And uh, yeah, you nailed it. <laughs> the restaurant industry here in New York City has been you know, decimated. If you take a walk around the city now, you'd be, you'd be stunned to see what it looks like uh, in terms of the outdoor structures, the lack of people um, in both the office, tourism, um, and just, you know, everyday uh, sort of activity is completely, you know, a fraction of what it was. Um, but I do think, um, you know, I'm, I, I focus primarily here in the suburbs of Westchester County, Fairfield County, Connecticut, Metro New York area. 
Um, we have not had it so bad here. It has not been, um, you know, we here in Westchester County, we've been at 50% occupancy since the end of June, I believe, uh, middle of June. So um, there has been a tremendous demand for second gen space, but there just aren't <laughs> any spaces because um, all the good operators took the advantage, took the opportunity rather to have the conversation with their landlord and, and figure it out and, and make it work. And obviously since they weren't um, so impacted and had indoor dining and, and their occupancy at 50% for so long, it wasn't such a tough conversation. Um, but I think in regards to the city, um, I think it's at a sort of precipice right now. You know, I think if some of these operators can take advantage of, of the situation that they're in, uh, maybe looking to grow a little bit, uh, they could be in for a real boom, um, you know, shortly, you know, maybe in September, in the fall or in the winter. Um, I think it's that window's closing a little bit, but um, it's a very interesting time right now for restaurants in New York. The uh, I saw that like uh, retailers are actually moving back in because of the reduced rents, and it's creating a really good opportunity. I saw that Pinko went in a, in a retail location last week in Soho. I thought that was all good news. Um, and I hear, you know, again, back to the residential real estate jam session. So I want to do it first because I can kind of get a feeling about where people are migrating to. And it sounds like people are moving back into the city in New York, in Manhattan. And yeah. I mean, the reduced rents are driving younger pop or allowing the younger population to come in. So I think you're going to see a real uptick in restaurants over the next several months. Don't you agree? I agree. And I, and I think what's important to understand about like the New York dynamic is people who move here from other parts of the country or even from the suburbs, you move to Manhattan for the whole experience, right? Right. Like the younger, the younger singles and right out of college, right out of grad school, it's the dating scene, it's Broadway, it's the Knicks, it's the nightlife, it's everything. Um, so a little bit of each one of those components start to come back, coupled with the reduced rents on the residential side, it starts to look you know, more appealing, more optimistic. Plus everybody's just like freaking out to get back to doing anything uh, remotely social. So uh, I think it creates a tremendous opportunity for these operators who are in a position to, to capitalize on it. Yeah, on the retail side, how much of a, do you know, approximately a percentage basis, how much of a discount that landlords are offering right now, or are they sticking true to their number? They're saying, no, I got to have this number. I can tell you here in the suburbs, landlords are not budging on their numbers at all. Uh, okay. In the city, it's been a case-by-case -case basis, kind of depending on who the landlord is. Uh, I'm working with a longtime operator, very well-established guy in the city who was kicked out of his space after 28 years. Um, and I'm, you know, have conversations with younger guys, startup groups who are getting, you know, 30% discounts off of the, the, the pre-COVID rents um, and have, you know, very friendly COVID language in their LOIs and their leases. So it really is a case by case basis, depending on, on the landlord's financial situation. Um, but, you know, I, I'm optimistic here that we're, we're sort of at a, a point where restaurants can take advantage of, of these opportunities that are there, either in second gen spaces or building out um, existing retail spaces or, or new development projects. Yeah, yeah, it's looking pretty strong in the next 18 to 24 months. There's just really some, I've heard that some of the landlords are, you know, they're a little dis you know, discounted rent for the next 24 months, you know, 12 to 24 months, and it starts ticking up pretty regularly. And if they're willing to do that, I think they're going to start filling your spaces up fairly quickly. So yeah. uh, anybody have any questions for Kyle? All right, Joanna. Thanks. Well, I do, I, do just wanna, I do, I do want to just echo a little bit of Kyle, what he was saying and, and what I've experienced um, is you know, there's so there's such a wide variety of owners in the Metro New York area from legacy property owners to institutions to wealthy investors to billionaires. So I totally understand there's such a, a different experience with every single owner up here. And it's so hard. And even from, you know, my view, you know, I, Joanna Rotundi, I work for RPT Realty. I was at Regency Centers for um, eight, nine years before that. I've been in the REIT space and acquisitions for almost 15 years. And I have always worked in what is, what used to be sleepy, uninteresting suburban markets and essential retail, which now is coined as essential retail and used to be necessity and grocery anchored and everything that was just boring to an investor, nothing high street, nothing sexy. And now it's in vogue and 
extremely frothy. I would say anything south of 50 million is very, very competitive. I've always worked in suburban space in Metro New York. And then with Regency, I expanded my pro, um, my footprint to the Northeast and now, and Mid-Atlantic. And now with RPT, I've expanded, you know, almost, I have no cap on what market I can work in. So I've had some experience all down the East Coast, Texas, even Phoenix, looking at some stuff, Colorado, California. So over the last six to eight months, um, or I would say I've been here almost five months, so it feels like forever, but um, I've, I've got to see a lot of what's happening, but it primarily the space I work in is what essential or investment grade retail and it can vary from a qsr like carol's working with a chick-fil-a paying a three and something quarter cap uh, for which i'm not paying but i see those things trading for 1200 bucks a foot which is insane um to your largest you know, wegmans or costco walmart you you name it um any type of what we would say whoever paid rent in april of 2020 is the type of tenant that i work with um, so uh, back to just what I'm seeing in my in my market, particularly, I'll start with the Metro New York is mostly uh, suburban. So I would say it, we were in a holding pattern, right, for uh, whatever it was, three to six months where nothing had traded. But then I'd say over the summer, there was a significant amount of triple net opportunities like um, I had sold for Regency a Whole Foods in, in Boston MSA for like a five and a quarter cap. And then you'll see your random QSRs being um, parceled off of shopping centers or any any investment grade retail where maybe an owner needed to liquidate some cash to fund another project. So it, depending on the situation, it, it, it depends on whether or not things uh, are trading in our market, but under 50 million is because of the um, low interest rates and people taking advantage of the debt markets right now, it's extremely competitive. And um, I would say of north of 50 million, it's the air's a little thinner, but it's still competitive because there are RPT and, and others. Like we just actually closed a billion seven raise of debt and equity with our partners. We have three strategic partners. One is GIC, Singapore Sovereign Wealth, um, Zimmer and Monarch. And we are really focused on triple net. However, what we're doing is not just triple net. We're taking down big power centers and we will operate it under the RPT umbrella and then individually work with um, some of the tenants that I've described that you would consider selling separately. Um, so it's us taking down those $100 million deals and then breaking it out within our um, own JV structure, I think is a unique opportunity for all of us. So um, I'm actually in contract to buy um, some, I mean, we can't really, I'm a public company, so we can't really discuss, but we, we are going to contract on something very soon um, in our market and we'll be announcing a lot of activity here soon, but it's been extremely competitive mm -hmm. in every suburban bedroom community with investment grade retail that I've seen since the beginning of COVID. It's just, someone had to make that first deal in order for then everyone to follow through. So I don't think that there's enough data points to support exactly where things are going. The cap rates have stayed pretty static. The NOI has changed, you know, depending on where you are. But I would say if anybody's still talking about a rearage or COVID rent structures, it's like stay away from that deal because or stay away from those tenants or mark them down permanently. I mean, there's just like anything that I would say that I'm underwriting that still has that um, stigma of like a rearage or, or issues. It's like, that's a mark down permanently. So that's where your NOI changes, but cap rates, I think are compressing. What do you see going, going forward the next 18 to 24 with triple net? Do you think it's still going to stay this strong? I think that it's, it's a, extremely difficult, um, to, to think that we're going to maintain these, these, uh, this because compression of cap rates because right now it's a frenzy like I, every time I hear California and what's going on there it makes me feel better about New York City although it's really um you know tough and but it's amazing how we're all in different states and living in the same country and have completely different um experiences of what's happening but uh I would say until we're going to continue to see this cap rate comp compression until there's a level playing field 
across the country until we're all at the same pace. We're all dealing with the same governmental, you know, ways to like, there's no restrictions. And I would say that that'll then I think level things out. Um, and I think in the interim, there's a lot of opportunity to take advantage of it. I still believe in the hustle and bustle of every city of, of, of the country. And, and I'm, I see more and more that it all depends on who the ownership is and what their needs and requirements are in the short term. A lot of people have debt coming due or, or, um, cash requirements to backfill. So like those are opportunities where people like ourselves will hope be, hopefully be able to take advantage of because I believe they will come back. I already see um, as you know, Kyle probably knows all too well that we're getting um, very stir crazy in the suburbs and people want to go back. And there's a lot of younger generation who, you know, maybe have and I, I say this lightly, but there's a lot of younger generation that have wealthy family and want to move back in those cities and they're going in droves. Like I know lots of kids that came out of great colleges, had wonderful success, have no job and you know, working for their family or working for, I mean, there's, there's a lot of people that want to be in the city and, and they're extremely talented and will find opportunities there that they won't anywhere because there's just so much um, I think that's that's needed in these cities, and uh, I'm excited to see what's going to happen after we get out of this. I heard someone say, um, "What's his name from Shark Tank?" He was like, "What well, Shark Tank? Uh, once we're out of this, he's like, there's going to be a party for like five years <laughs> after this is over." And I'm ready for that party. From your mouth to God's ears, I think after yeah. <laughs> what everybody here has been through, or everybody in the industry has been, or everybody period has been through the last year, I think I think we're due for a nice party. Um, does, does anybody have any questions for anybody on the panel? I mean, the information was incredible. Uh, I'm really glad to see New York making a comeback. We were, I think everybody was very concerned about what was going on there. Uh, Eddie quit stealing California clients. Same with you in Florida. You guys need to stop. <laughs> George is going to go. He's going to have an altar at some point. But um, uh, All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for being involved. Uh, to our viewers, uh, if you ever need a good broker, I guess, Joanna, you're not a broker, but if you need to invest, talk to Joanna. Otherwise, these agents are all top-notch. That's why they're here today. Make sure you reach out to them. Uh, follow them on Instagram. Man, these people are solid on their, their marketing, so on their social marketing. So make sure you follow them. Uh, panelists, thank you very much uh, for, for being involved today and giving us all this great information. And uh, I hope we can do this again in the future. So thank you very much. Thanks, Joe.